स्टार्ट 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 Good morning to one and all present here on this platform. I, Shikhar Bamrutwar from BCA second year, on behalf of the management, our principal, Dr. K T Thomas Sir, and the staff of Saint Francis D Sales College, Nagpur, welcome you all to the one-day webinar to celebrate the National Unity Day. Saint Francis D Sales College was established in 1956 by the late Archbishop Eugene de Souza. The college is one of the premier institutions of Nagpur, Maharashtra. The college is a multi-stream institution of higher education offering both graduate and postgraduate programs in arts and science. The institution is concerned with providing a holistic development to the students, fostering a self-reliance and building confidence enhanced by the qualities of keenness, cooperation and fair-mindedness to become the incorruptible citizens of tomorrow. With the ongoing pandemic affecting life in all spheres, SFS college has moved ahead to provide the teachers and students best possible opportunities by incorporating new and innovative learning experiences by organizing webinars on diverse themes and topics the webinar is organized to celebrate the national unity day and to generate awareness and work for the betterment of the country to reaffirm and inherit strength to withstand potential threats to the unity integrity and security of the country 
National Unity Day is celebrated on 31st of October every year since 2014 to mark the birth anniversary and pay tribute to Sardar Vallabhai Patel. To acknowledge and honor his efforts and contributions in uniting the nation, India celebrates National Unity Day or Rashtriya Ekta Divas on his birth anniversary. On 31st of October 2014, while introducing this day, Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji had recalled the mantra of Ek Bharat, Shreshth Bharat and said that Sardar Vallabhai Patel gave us Ek Bharat and we should all work towards creating Shreshth Bharat. I am profusely overjoyed to take this opportunity to welcome and introduce our chief guest of today's webinar, Father Justice Paul, to our August gathering. Father Justice Paul completed his BA Honours in English Literature from North Bengal University in 1975. He has cleared the Indian Civil, Civil, uh, Indian Civil Service examinations, IAS and UPSC in 1977 and served as a gazetted officer in the Ministry of Communications, Government of India from 1978 to 1983. Father Justice has also acquired PhD from the University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Rome in 2009. We had also worked as a professor and rector of St. Charles Nagpur. Father Justice Paul is a polyglot who can speak English, Malayalam, Hindi, Italian and Latin very fluently. The presence of such a personality between us is a blessing. I now request Father Justice Paul to give his precious inputs and to deliver the inaugural address of today's webinar. Over to you, Father. Thank you so much, Shrika, for introducing me and introducing the event, first of all. And uh, you have done it very well. God bless you. Well, dear friends, um, I can. I hope you can all hear me well. All right. OK. Very dear and respected Professor Katie Thomas, principal of SFS College. Respected speakers of the day, Dr. Lata Nair, Dr. Priyadarshini Rajendran and Dr. Christopher Abraham and dear participants of this webinar on the occasion of the National Unity Day. Aap sabonko pranam. As all of us are aware, since the year 2014, we have been celebrating the National Unity Day on 31st October, which is the birthday of Sardar Vallabhai Patel the Iron Man of India. On this day, we celebrate the unity and integrity of our nation through various events organized in different parts of the country. However, this year, as a result of the pandemic, all public gatherings and events are restricted. And so we here in SFS College, Nagpur, are happy to mark the occasion with this webinar on national unity. Let us remind ourselves that as a young man, Sardar Vallabhai Patel set aside his career as a lawyer and joined Mahatma Gandhi in his fight for freedom for India. Sardar Vallabhai Patel was the Home Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister of the very first Indian government. It was he who brought about the unification of 565 princely states into one Indian nation when we gained independence from the British rule in 1947. In the year 2018, the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, dedicated to the nation the tallest statue of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Today, as we celebrate the National Unity Day on his birthday, it is important to take pride in the strength and beauty of our nation. We Indians are aware of an underlying cultural unity, cultural and spiritual unity that binds us together as we cherish our enormous diversity in unity, our regional and local differences manifested in a multitude of regional languages, different styles of dress, cuisines and food habits, customs and celebrations and whatnot. On no other nation on earth can boast of such a variety of everything that exists in India. About the relevance and the observance of the Rashtriya Ekta Divas, 
the official statement of the Home Ministry of India says that it will provide an opportunity to reaffirm the inherent strength and resilience of our nation to withstand the actual and potential threats to unity, integrity and security of our country. As we celebrate this day, we can of course glory in the past about our freedom struggle led by the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhiji, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Vallabhai Patel and hundreds of others. But it is not enough to glory in the past and the gifts God has given to our country. We must also take a responsibility for the safety and happiness of all Indians, among whom there is such an alarming economic disparity that forces millions of our countrymen to go hungry to bed every night. <clears throat> we saw thousands of migrant workers going back home when the pandemic struck. We heard about how they traveled by trains and buses and trucks and cycles and on foot. We saw alarming photographs of their blistered feet. We read about how many of them died on the way and most of those who did not die are now returning to the cities to find work to stay alive. The poor quality of health infrastructure, antenatal care, maternal health and postnatal post natal care, malnutrition, poor sanitation puts us on top of the world for infant mortality. In 2018, an estimated 8,82,000 children under five died in India, the highest in the world. Mahatma Gandhi had said that when the government forms policies and enacts laws, it must think of how it will impact the poorest man in the country. About 70% of Indians directly or indirectly depend upon agriculture for their livelihood. Unfortunately, there have been a spate of farmer suicides in India due to lack of laws to protect farmers, the heavy burden of debts, poor government policies, corruption with regard to subsidies, crop failure and lack of social support systems. We have also seen a spate of violence and bloodshed in the name of religion. And the number of rape and murder of women has gone up. Many of uh, many such events do not come to public public view as the victim and their families fear the criminals and also want to avoid the loss of good name in the society. Even when cases are reported, the criminals who commit these crimes go free and we know why investigations lead nowhere. We must be aware of these threats to our unity and integrity and strive to overcome these miseries with the determination and political will. Today, as the nation is learning to fight the pandemic and we hope that life will return to the normal soon, on this National Unity Day, we must pledge to take responsibility for the welfare of our nation. On this National Unity Day, apart from delivering speeches, we must seriously examine why after 73 years since independence, the vast majority of us are still poor and hungry. We can blame the greed of the rich, rampant corruption of those who hold power, poor planning and the lack of political will to root out evils both economic and social. This blame game will not save us. We must act. That brings me back to Sardar Vallabhai Patel, the Iron Man of India, who fought against the British Raj to save the farmers of Gujarat in the Bardoli Satyagraha of June 1928. After the success of the Satyagraha, the women of Bardoli gave him the title Sardar, which means leader. And Sardar became a leader of great status in the freedom struggle. We have honored him by building the tallest statue in the whole world for him. 
we must also follow his footsteps to build the nation. We should take the who should take the lead. It's not merely the top leadership that need to act. We must act from the grassroots grassroots level. I must begin the nation building with myself first and then with my family and then my neighborhood and beyond. So today each of us must start setting our minds right in the path of Ahimsa and Satyagraha. Dear to Gandhiji and Sardar Vallabhai Patil and to all the great leaders of our nation. Yes, I must begin first by cleaning my heart of all hatred and selfishness. Then I must clean my room, my house, my immediate neighborhood, my environment and move beyond. Dear friends, as we now look forward to hearing the chief speakers of the day, Dr. Lata Nair, Dr. Priyadarshini Rajendran, and Dr. Christopher Abraham, I now inaugurate the webinar on National Unity Day. Jai Hind. Thank you, Father, for delivering such an inspiring talk. Your words are a great source of encouragement to all of us, and we will definitely work towards to uphold the principles and walk the path set forth by our great eminent leaders. It was a great pleasure to have you amongst us on this memorable day. Once again, I thank you, Father Justice Paul. Thank you. God bless you. Now I request Prabhu Prakash to take over from me and take the proceedings further into the day. Over to you, Prakash. Thank you, Shekhar. Good morning, one and all. He who experiences the unity of life sees his own self in all beings and all beings in his own self and looks on everything with an impartial eye, said Buddha. Keeping in our mind the above saying of Buddha, I, Prabhu Prakash, a student of BS second year, extend a warm welcome to all who are present on this platform to listen to the views and ideas of experts on the occasion of National Unity Day. We are honored to have Dr. Lata Nair Madam with us today and I consider it a great privilege to welcome and introduce Dr. Nair Madam to our gathering. Dr. Lata Nair Madam hails from Kerala and is currently working as an associate professor in the Department of English and Center for Research at St. Teresa's College, Kochi. Dr. Nair was appointed as the director of the Goon Center in India after she undertook a training program at the State Kansas University, US in June 2014. She is also the course coordinator and director of the UGC Innovative Program, BSc in Apparel and Fashion Designing. It was under her initiative that the Department of English at St. Teresa's College became a research center in 2007. Dr. Nair has been responsible in fostering linkages with many national and international universities. She has collaborated with London Metropolitan University, the Richmond University, the American International University, UK, the State Kansas University, US, and Deccan University, Australia, for facilitating research initiatives. She was able to establish the Goon Center for Science Fiction Studies, which is affiliated to the State Kansas University, to promote creative writing and science fiction writing in India. She is closely associated with Vartiyar University, Coimbatore, Amrita School of Social, Social Sciences, Kerala, Bharati Dasan University, Trichy, Karunaya University, Coimbatore, Sri Sankara University, Kerala, the University of Kerala, and the University of Calicut. A postgraduate in English with first class from the University of Kerala, Dr. Nair continued her studies in Mahatma Gandhi University 
from where she secured her phd in english language and literature in the year 2000 she has been teaching at st teresa's college since 1990 and in 2005 she joined london metropolitan university uk to pursue her second ma in international english language teaching and applied language studies she has also qualified celta cambridge in the year 2006 from uk in the year 2014 dr nayar attended the training program for teaching science fiction and creative writing at the intensive institute on sf literature state kansas university dr nayar has written many articles in various research journals a few chapters in various compilation volumes she has written many books which have been prescribed for calicut and kerala universities her books mainly english for media 2014 writing for media 2012 focus on the use of english in print visual and digital media she has written many popular articles in various dailies she has traveled extensively and lectured at several universities in the country as well as abroad her area of interest are science fiction promoting sustainable education in villages literacy integrated humanism curriculum design language and linguistics postmodernism and emotional content in teaching and training community relation officers and trainings dr nayas recent dr nayas recent research project was on emotional content in democratic policing which focuses on enhancing the emotional and social intelligence of the police officers that would bring sustainable transformation in community policing dr lata madam has so many achievements to her credit that if i go on mentioning the whole day will be less so without taking so much of your time i prabhu prakash once again extend a heartfelt welcome to dr lata nayar ma'am and request her to take over this session at the same time i would request the participants and the listeners to post their queries in comment box so that we may forward it to the experts to answer it to them it's over to you madam thank you prakash ji for that um, introduction and i just don't know whether i'm worthy of all that uh, thank you so much um, for making me very special and i take this opportunity to greet a uh, father justice uh paul who made a very um very apt beginning about uh speaking about the national integration especially he highlighted and integrated into it the concerns and reflections that should be a part of any uh indian or who is a citizen of india who is proud to be an indian i also take this opportunity to thank with all humility the principal uh, of sfs college who 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 will never ever hear a no from me um sir i'm sure that you are there and i extend my pranams to you uh with all warmth and i also extend Uh, my gratitude to all the faculty members of SFS College and all those participants who are waiting to listen to me. This is just um, a sharing of thoughts, which is of late been my in my with me for some time uh, after the free virus has uh, um, started or is set off like a chemical reaction on our. on a um, uh, landscape or maybe academic landscape would be better so i just offer you my thoughts um maybe this will trigger some um very 
explosive thoughts, but that is what we should be doing as academicians. So I just with all um, uh, humility and my prayers, I begin my session and I hope and pray that this would definitely at least some of you would uh, think about this and let us all join together on this day of national integration. Work for our nation selflessly with commitment and unconditional love. So I would just I have put together a small presentation for you. Um, I hope uh, that will also um, be keeping you occupied and uh, and you will be able to focus on your thoughts as I uh, uh, start my lecture. Thank you. I hope. Um, yes, <clears throat> can you see it? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Your screen is seen here. Is that visible? Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So let me uh, take you on this journey. That is, I have titled my uh, talk for the day as Vande Madaram, and we, I know all of us um, feel lucky that we are living in one of the largest democratic nations of the world. And what are the things that is, we are speaking today about national integration and the theme of nationalism. So I thought, let me begin this um, uh, in a different way. Let me take you back to my childhood where um, the family was situated uh, right in the freedom movement. My two grandfathers were freedom fighters. Uh, one belonged to the Congress and the other was a communist. Uh, and there was a lot of discussions that I have as a child witnessed to but it didn't make any sense at that time. And we are the boom children, my generation that is born after 1960. You are the boom children. So I still remember um, this particular lines uh, that were sung by my uncles and aunts and also by my father who was never a singer, but he used to hum these two lines whenever he came back home from his busy schedule and um, actually uh, I never had a clue as to where uh, this came from or what it was and you never think about where from where does this theme of nationalism come from. So that is how we begin and I'm taking and that is why I thought this was the right premise uh, to begin um, this session. So this, these are the two lines. Aaj Himale ki choti se fir humne lalkara hai. Dur hato e dunia walo Hindustan hamara hai. From the top of Himalayas, we have again challenged keep away foreigners. India is our land. I never realized till of late that these two li lines, which I sang with my uncles, or which I heard my father singing or. Uh, sorry, yes. ma'am. Excuse yes. me, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, your screen is not um, is full screen actually that presentation. Um, is that OK now? Uh, is it, it ma'am a PDF file or it's a PowerPoint? It is. No, 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 no. It is not a PDF file. It, it, it must show full screen actually. It is not. Uh, if, uh, can you try again? Uh, stop sharing and again start sharing. Okay, sir. Uh, choose the very first option, desktop. Open share tray. Yeah. yeah. Desktop. Yes. Is that okay? Screen one, isn't it? Or oh, one day. Yes, 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 yes. Screen one. Right, ma'am, right. Okay. Is 
is that fine now is that fine now dilip ji is it fine now uh sorry ma'am uh, dilip i don't know where is gone it's still back to the same uh, condition ma'am uh, uh, shall i shall i share from my side i i think that will be better so that i don't get distracted if i lose this continuity i won't be able yes. to yeah okay we'll just stop sharing i'll share i'll do the uh, stop sharing yeah is it visible from my side I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. Did you come in? Yeah. Father. And now it's okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is full so screen. Please go ahead. Full screen now. Full screen. Yeah. You go can hide. The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So I we go on to the second slide, sir. I think as I move, you would be able to. Yeah. So coming back to the, can I start now? Yes, ma'am. so coming back to the story so this was a song that uh, which was a part of my childhood and when i of late when i did a little bit of research i found out that this belonged to the movie kismet which was released before independence in 1943 and one of the first rousing nationalist lyrics to come out of bollywood context and the context was it was at the bombay talkies that gyan mukherjee was directing a movie kismet in 1942 and this movie was also almost complete around the time mahatma gandhi gave a call for quit india movement and news of gandhi and other leaders including um, i mean all the uh, nine ratnas of india at that point of time were being imprisoned uh, imprisoned and he forced uh his lyric writer called pradeep to write a song to call english to quit india so that it could be used in that particular movie sridhar mukherjee was known for his relentless ways and it is exactly this that is mentioned by film historian prempal who notes that pradeep in was in a confused state of mind and asked mukherjee that how could he uh, uh, put a patriotic revolutionary song in a movie which is about a pickpocket and his love life but sridhar ji was adamant and hence pradeep wrote these lyrics of that immortal song aaj himalay ki choti se phir humne lal kara hai from the top of himalaya we have again challenged so this theme of nationalism when you look at the theme of nationalism i am very happy that father justice paul has introduced i was little apprehensive uh, how am i going to begin this theme of nationalism today i wouldn't say a new ecology is emerging when you analyze this theme of resurgence of nationalism of course i can i we accept that there is a lot of convergence that has been happening in our daily life with the rise of technology media industry popular personal computing and the rapid extension of concrete media forms and when you look at democracy we are proud to say that we have a democracy we have the largest democracy in the world we have a government of the people by the people and for the people and democracy has always been considered a goal which is a long way off ever since the onset of differentiated economy and stratified society and throughout history we took oligarchy for democracy and always believed that the bourgeoisie democracy could be transformed into real democracy through con through constitutional reforms and one liberal political 
political scientist whom I admire the most, even contemplated the globalization of Western uh, liberal democracy and the subsequent end of history in, co uh, in uh, quotation mark as imminent. And this particular, I, I would recommend all of you to read this particular political scientist. He was very famous at the time when I was doing research, that is in 1990, 92, Fukuyama. And you couldn't get a copy. It was um, when I, I still remember when we went to Seafell, you know, you had to wait for weeks together to get a photocopy of this particular book mm, and then and to get hold of him to get at least to see what exactly he means and expectedly a total rebuttal of the end of history thesis came with reference to the awakening of history under the revolutionary forces of people. That has been happening whenever there is a rupture in our intellectual thought, whenever the socio-economic or political strategies become very fundamentalistic, there is a rupture that happens and people, the revolutionary force of people will definitely come together. And this is cited by Badiou in 2012. I'm not going to give you the theoretical framework, but let me uh, let me tell you there were prophetic writers who looked at at the situation at who have had the experience of making prophetic comment about what will happen when uh, the so-called democracy and capitalism come together and when they become very porous uh, uh, porous in their nature. So capitalist expansion and democratization are popularly represented by the magical term development. We all know that and that is a reality. However, the unbridled development of capitalism is invariably based on over exploitation of natural resources and the consequent impoverishment of tribal people, expansion of middle class and transformation of the nation into sometimes um, uh, very uh, skeptically we could say that and the fear of our nation reduced into a crony capitalist state and the latest phase of capitalism namely that is what we are experiencing now what you term as techno capitalism with its corporate system of organization and highly centralized uh, top heavy uh, administration um, I, I think with its um, uh, the top uh, uh, heavy administration which is termed as corporatocracy corporatocracy signifies maybe the measured death of our freedom See, this is exactly what happened when India became a colony under British. I think I have stated this earlier. That is in the book called Anarchy. Um, William Dalrymple says that India was India was colonized only because the Indians willed it to be colonized by the British. And Mahatma Gandhi, in many of his writings, have stated the fact that. Uh, if not for Indians, India would never have made, um, never have been made a colony under British. So it was the Jagat Sage who, in you know, the Jagat says the money lenders in Calcutta who helped the uh, helped uh, uh, Clive to colonize. To they are the main, they were the main funders, and they were responsible for making India a colony under British. That is history that you can read about. I mean, it is freely available. That book is also very interesting reading. It subverts the entire concept of the colonization of India. So it gives you a different uh, aspect altogether. And Dalrymple has also said that corporations or corporatocracy becomes Frankenstein because they remain unaccountable in its way. There are no moral values attached to this corp big corporations. Now that is on one side when we celebrate uh, national integration or na the so-called concept of unity. And then let us look at where does nationalism as a narrative now emerge at our, on our cultural landscape. And during and immediately after independence, the idea of India as a nation, what does it mean? 
mean? I, I think it means the issues of its people, the challenges that it had to overcome to emerge as a newborn nation state and a sense of coming together. That was more important despite our regional differences. That is where you can see the Iron Man of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. You should read about the kind of task he initiated. It, it was a probable impossibility and and Gandhiji knew that only one man could do this and he chose Sardar Vallabhai Patel to do this. You, There are interesting stories, many interesting stories about Sardar Vallabhai Patel and Gandhiji. <laughs> Sardar Vallabhai Patel never used to um, be comfortable with Gandhi. Gandhi went, took the, um, you, uh, you know, he persistently went on nag nudging Patel and finally he conceded. He did, He had so much of prejudice against Gandhiji, but that wilted when Sardar Vallabhai Patel came to know the essence of Mahatma. Then and that started a new beginning for India as well. So in uh, and the stories of annexation, the stories of consolidating India is a fascinating story or a fascinating part of Indian history, which you would find if you have not read it, please read it. There are fascinating stories about this jingoistic state, warring tribal, warring chieftains, warring small kingdoms and fiefdoms and how Patel strategically planned and annexed um, uh, these states and small kingdoms in fiefdoms into the nation as it is. So from jingoism to nation, nationhood was not easy for a country like India. And this particular concept of nationhood or nationalism in those days, I still remember those narratives were constructed and disseminated to the public via live speeches by leaders and a portion in press and publishing industry. I still remember there was this all these um, um, uh, leaders that is when when uh, Jawaharlal Nehru came to in uh, Kerala or when uh, any of those leaders came to India, the, the party workers saw to it. They hired the best bilingual translators so that they uh, gave the audience the essence. Mm -hmm. So um, and papers at that time and there was this song Hindu Dinamani Indian Express that was also a part uh, a song that was a part of our childhood. So papers like Kesari Hindustan Times, uh, the Hindu Bengal Gazette and then of course Tagore, uh, writers like Tagore, Naidu, Ram Mohan Roy, Premchand, Bengim Chandra Chatterjee, just to mention a few, they were all instrumental in giving form to the fledgling narrative of India as a nation. Now, uh, uh, Dilip, uh, Dilip sir, I would request you to just keep the movie ready, uh, this video clipping ready. Now let us take a look at the movies that were striving to discover and articulate this new identity for India as a promising developing uh, nation. Now the, mil the millennial movies and a new empire of hope rising from the ashes of colonial pillaging backed by an ancient, uh, ancient and rich cultural uh, legacy. Let us take a peep. Let us uh, see how the Indian Bollywood movies. Um, sir, I request you to uh, uh, play the Dilip, sir. Actually, I could not see any play button there. Which slide? Uh, that is um, the there is a dancing picture. Did you see that? That is slide number six. This one. One second, sir. Ah, yes, yes. It is not playing man. Um, thing from my side, it is. Yeah, yeah. 
I just don't know. Like, uh, I think it is playing from my side. Uh, let me try to share the screen then. It's a presentation. That's why. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I have inserted that. Sunny, sir, can you share the screen, please? Help me share the screen so that I can play it from my side. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Sure. Uh, just click on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arrow button. Let me try, and then if that happens, let it happen. Otherwise, we'll continue with the lecture. No issues. Is it is it audible now? Uh, madam, you have to select that audio button uh, when you start selecting. Uh, when you sh start sharing, uh, at that time there is a button, audio button. Okay. Uh, Again, uh, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Again, start sharing. Okay. At that time, you will see. Uh, just above that desktop button at the top, there will be button of uh, you know, include or uh, computer audio. So, desktop screen one. Ah, uh, include yeah, audio. Just, oh, fine, right. fine. Thank you. Now I can share, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry for about that, but I thought let us. Can you see this?
I I I hope uh, this is uh, Ava and this is being with us. Oh my country, oh my country, always be free wherever I am in the world. You are in my memory. So the stars. I mean, I just wanted you to understand that this is the kind of. Of course, we feel so energized when you watch these movies in the theater, and you feel that the task of uniting India. falls to indian cinema as a strongest platform to seed this idea of nationhood so from papers printed media now this is been taken to buy the indian movies especially right down to the grassroots levels of our country and accordingly nations with discursively injured development uncritically accept their status exactly as construed by the development discourses and we know that the, we need like narratives like this because they establish the idea that people ought to overcome developmental challenges and in india you know what a sir father justice had already uh, given you an idea about the challenges that we have the infrastructure facilities education poverty casteism sectarianism all these have to be you know overlooked or overcome and we should be patriotic enough to still win for the country despite all of this this glorification of a this this the glorification of this narrative in fact distracts and acclimatizes people to the idea that things may not change so fast but you should be inspired to succeed in spite of it for the sake of your country which is definitely true instead of focusing your energies on changing the system of fighting for equity there in lies the trouble see we should be there for a nation we should fight for our nation our national integration but at the same time we cannot remain ignorant about the challenges that are there that the nation is facing at the moment so now what is happening to our unity that is a question that are plaguing us now terrorism and insurgencies as we know are everyday occurrences it does create a sense of paranoia in the collective psyche and that is what responds so well to the nationalism narrative of protectionism and sacrificing life for the nation's security attributes like valor aggression against the enemy for the sake of one's country outwitting the enemy these are all things that resonate definitely very deeply within us and this not only kindles patriotic fever but also draws a psychological allegiance to the nation state and conveys a sense of pride in belonging to the to the nation as we are but more importantly it fosters a sense of faith for those in governance and those in charge of the nation's security in real life now the 21st century has been a period of great progress of course for india in terms of science medicine technology etc the narrative of india as once a cradle of knowledge and innovation now stepping up to reclaim that legacy through its scientific advancement economic growth social justice and empowerment etc along with the neo liberal policies and open markets have led to globalization and also corporate influence the only concern is are we aware of the fatal trap which comes with the rise of transnational imperialism this is not only true for india but also for many other uh, many other countries or who are on the path of progress and development because it dissolves fearlessly fiercely the debated issues created by problematic governance and instead serves as a new opium for the masses giving them a beautiful illusion to believe in the distinctiveness of the nation its culture heritage courage and progress and as we all know every human community is formed 
by shared values. Let us take account of what we assume as right and wrong. This is also decided as we know by our common consent. Now what is happening to our universe, the concept of our uni unity in diversity? There is economic crisis. Along with that, what I dread is this toxic hatred based on caste. We need to be very cautious at this moment when you celebrate national integration. As responsible citizens, we need to deal with all this all pervading prejudices of caste, creed, religion and class that are completely in place in India. As a citizen of India, I'm worried about the, this hatred and prejudice that we carry. I feel that these are more dangerous than the free virus that we dread now. We are all longing for a return to normalcy. But now where the spirit of Western na nationalism prevails, the whole, the whole world is being taught from boyhood to foster hatred and ambition by all kinds of means, by manufacture of half truths and untruths, not only in history, but in our academic places as well, by persistent misrepresentation of other races and culture of unfavorable sentiments towards them, and by setting up of memorials, events very often false, which for the sake of humanity should speedily be forgotten thus continually brewing evil menace towards neighbors, towards one's own people, towards other nations than our own. What I dread is this poisoning. This poisoning, this is poisoning the very fountain head of humanity. It is discrediting the ideals which were born of the lives of great men like Mahatma Gandhi, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, Jawaharlal Nehru, who were our greatest and best. It is holding up gigantic selfishness as a one universal region for all nations of the world, the concept of Vasudeva Kudumbagam. So it is time to recognize and sensitize our fellow beings about our constitution. See, as teachers or as academicians, how many of us think about our constitution? What I feel is our constitution is the greatest book of compassion. There are the Navaratnas of the constitution that can alone safeguard and preserve the unity of our country. Now, what are the Navaratnas? I will be very brief. Sovereignty. People have supreme right to make decisions on internal as well as external matters. Socialism. Wealth is generated socially and should be shared equally by society. We should be secular. Citizens have complete freedom to follow any religion. And we are the greatest democratic nation, a form of government where people enjoy equal political rights, elect their rulers and hold them accountable. And the Republic, the concept of Republic, the head of the state is an elected person and it is not a hereditary position. It cannot be a hereditary position. And then comes the most important of all this justice. Citizens cannot be discriminated on the grounds of caste, religion and gender, and it is an inclusive culture that should be prevailing in India. Social inequalities have to be reduced and then comes liberty. There are no unreasonable restrictions on the citizens in what they think, how they wish to express their thoughts and so on. And then comes equality and fraternity. All are equal before law. All of us should behave as if we are members of the same family, the concept of Vasudeva Kudumbagam in place. And as I told you, this is it is absolutely essential 
that as teachers, as academicians, as responsible citizens, this constitution, what are the rights and privileges, duties, and the essence of constitution should be made a part of legal literacy in our campuses, as well as the teachers, especially when we hold a very responsible position, you should be knowing what are the fundamental rights that are preserved in our constitution. And the essence of our constitution is Ahimsa. Ahimsa is not only non-violence, but recognize the capacity or facilitating or empowering our citizens to recognize the suffering of people and to transform it into a compassionate society. And the mission, of course, is welfare of the people and to build a compassionate society. So this is what, in essence, that we as, celebrate, we as citizens of India should be celebrating when we commemorate the memory of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. And now a brief glimpse to our pandemic portal. We are locked down. Locked down we were. We are now passing through the pandemic portal and we do not know the real contours of the crisis even now. People are still dying. The divide between the poor and the rich becoming more and more obvious and we may never know their stories. Some believe that it is God's way of bringing justice, God's way of bringing us to our senses. We have fought the famines, British floods, wars, aggression together as a nation. As Indians, we are proud to say that we emerged victorious. And when you look at our history, it was the victory of Ahimsa, people coming together, recognizing their suffering and historically. Hello? Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Ma'am, are you going to share the what file or PPT? Please stick with ma'am. Pardon? Are you going to share you? your what file or PPT? Yes, now PPT is being shared. Yes. Yes. Yes, now it is okay. Your word was being shared. Yeah. That is okay now. Is it yes. fine now? Yes, but if you could make it full screen by clicking on uh, now it is again PPT. Yes. Just near oh, again it is yes. near your zoom. Yes, click on that. Yes, click the same. Yes. Yes, click there. Okay. Yes, it is fine now. Yes, it is fine. fine. Yes. Yes. So now it is again back. This is OK. I think uh, if Sir shares that, it will be OK. Uh, even if you see my uh, talking points, that is OK. I just want you to look at this particular um, uh, uh, picture that was shared by J.R.D. Tata. And I would say that if you look deep down into those um, um, the small comment that he has written, the distance between this father and his daughter is hunger. So think before you waste food. And when I say that we are passing through the pandemic portal, we come to know that 60% of India, as father pointed out, are below poverty line. And along with the Corona angel, the angel that has wisened its grip is the hunger angel. Um, I will just take a, a, a break and uh, I would just um, sort this. Um, um, sir, would you uh, please share the screen so that I can continue my talk? Am I audible? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah, I have stopped sharing so you can. 
you know can i continue i'm winding up even if there is uh, no screen i will just conclude my thoughts you have come to the i just wanted you to see that one particular um, picture that was posted by jrd tata tata and uh, i was very particular that you should see this that made a whole lot of you know there is so much a world of meaning that came to me when i saw that particular uh, picture so shall i continue so now as i said the hunger angel has wisened its grip on us there are two options which i have put in here we can choose to walk through it dragging the carcasses of our hatred our avarice our data banks and our dead ideas our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us we can walk through it the second thing is we can we have two options the second option is we can walk through it fight it using our spiritual strength which is our greatest legacy by negating the carcasses of our hatred and prejudices by accomplishing the concept called nirvana nirvana means the state of happiness how do we achieve this state of happiness feeding your mind with positivity and reducing the grasping to oneself keep away from that idea of i me myself i did that i am responsible for this i me myself that alone can feed the mind with positivity another thing that is always recommended by dalai lama his holiness is starve the anger you should starve yourself of anger s t a r v e if my pronunciation is not clear starve yourself of anger and that alone will help you fight fundamentalism and as i conclude i i hope that i've been able to share my thoughts with you these are the thoughts i penned down yesterday night as i was sitting and thinking what am i going to share with my very distinguished audience and academicians from all over uh, india perhaps i just want to leave you the message that ahimsa or the path of non violence alone suffices and that alone will help us keep our nation together and i quote from sri sri ravi shankar who has given us an abc of life that is awareness belongingness and commitment awareness which nurtures intellect belongingness which nurtures the heart and commitment which nurtures life so let us take a vow to safeguard our na national unity by adopting the abc's of life and accepting the path of ahimsa or non violence i take this opportunity to thank all of you who helped me with this presentation there were glitches of course and but it doesn't matter because i feel very much at home when i am invited to be a part of sfs college i once again thank dilip ji who has been <laughs> guiding me through the technical uh, uh, um, giving me technical guidance and the glitches and the blunders that i commit he knows me now very well thank you dilip ji for holding my ha holding my hand and keeping me through this um, presentation and uh, thomas sir thank you so much for giving me one more opportunity i wish you all all the best and i wish all the other speakers uh, also uh, all my prayers and wishes thank you once again it was wonderful to listen to your wisdom ma'am
now i have received a few questions from our participants which i would like to forward to you with your yes. permission yes yes of course so ma'am the first question is this do you think a course on nationalism and citizenship should be made compulsory for students uh, in college curriculum and uh, what will be its uh, learning outcomes um i'm that's a brilliant question um actually i would revert that see i would say that legal literacy is what which is essential at the moment see i have we have just come up with a legal cell in our college it was a part of our research and consultancy cell and i wanted uh, i feel that students should be given an awareness of what are our fundamental rights what is this book of constitution and i of late i realize that our awareness that is the awareness of teachers awareness of women awareness of most of the academicians are very very um low when it come when it comes to legal literacy when you are rights are threatened you do not know how to write a complaint you do not know where to approach this is a very i do not know it is a time when you need that kind of an awareness to fight your battles most often i find people fighting their battles alone and when you are ignorant especially in these kind of areas especially if you lack legal literacy your fight loses its rigor so i would definitely say that legal literacy campaign is needed and i i feel that an introductory course which will should, should be very um carefully planned and implemented because it should be interesting as well in the sense case studies should be included hands on training should be given and you should get the best advocates of maybe um um lawyers or activists who have a vast experience in human rights and other things and that can definitely be considered as a part of curriculum and the second question is this man um how do you see nationalism how do you see nationalism in our post truth age that's that it uh, i should say that uh, that will be a very political statement you know uh, if i say nationalism is needed definitely that uh, as i said there should be that should be a part because you should love your nation and most of the reforms most of the transformation happened because we love india we care for this nation but we should be cautious i think i made it very clear in my uh, in my in my lecture that what we should be cautious is a kind of fundamentalism which i dread what i dread is the intense kind of hatred and greed and india is known for its diversity india has absorbed all cultures and religions like a blotting paper because it has known as a land of compassion and this is one quality that should be a part of our nationalism compassion and that is why i said let us starve anger our attitude now you should understand that 64% of our economy is based on agriculture father mentioned about farmers but i would tell you about 
the farmers how they what their mindscape is all about i have traveled by car through the banks of river uh, 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 godavari and the whole entire district of telangana you should see the farmers happily they go to till the land and if you stop by stop the car they would come and inquire what is and they will provide you with things that is that is the compassion that is their nature and they go back home after tilling the land and they sleep peacefully without anything in their mind and what is their attitude you know that the fact there is there are floods they lose they lose everything but they even then they go back to their land as an indian that should be our attitude nothing should take shake us it is based on compassion and you should remain rooted to the soil soil cleanses you earth earthiness is what should be a part of our nationalism and there is the you know uh, perseverance without paucity that is the farmer and you should have and you should know that buddhism the concepts of buddhism were taken from farming and this is what i as an academician as a human being as a woman would exhort compassion ahimsa should be a part of our nationalism that is what i want for my nation as a true citizen of india thank you so much dr nair madam for your enlightening talk and valuable words which have definitely encouraged us to put in our best effort to build a glorious india we all have benefited a lot from this amazing session so once again i prabhu prakash extend a my sincere gratitude for being with us today thank you madam thank you now i request ms shirley leo to take over from here over to you ms shirley leo thank you so much prabhu little pools of water tend to become stagnant and useless they are together form a big at the school and there is universal benefit this is quoted by none other than sardar vallabhbhai patel a very warm and happy morning to one and all present here i surely you student of b second year take this opportunity to welcome our source person dr priya tharshini rajendran and each one of you special webinar on the occasion of national unity day national Thank unity or rashtriya ekta divas is celebrated on 31st october every year on 14 to commemorate the birth anniversary of sardar vallabhbhai patel this year marks the 145th birth anniversary of sardar patel freedom fighter and later a politician who played a major role in the integration of india this day provides an opportunity to reaffirm the inherent strength and resilience of our nation to withstand the actual and potential threats to the unity integrity and security of our country i deem it an honor to introduce an eminent personality as a resource person for today's session to enlighten us with her words of wisdom we have with us a versatile and extremely knowledgeable person dr prithash rajendran dr rajendran ma'am is presently working as the associate professor and head department of zoology at lady dot college madurai her academic qualifications include first class in bsc zoology first class with special distinction and gold medal in msc zoology first class with special distinction in mphil she was awarded phd in the year 2016 ma'am has completed a ugc funded minor research project in the year 2005 to 
man has written and published numerous articles related to zoology. She was also a resource person in several conferences, seminars and workshops. She has contributed chapters in various books and has authored and edited the same. Dr. Priya Kharshini Ma'am has to her credit two patents fill for her inventions in aquaculture. As a scholar, Dr. Ma'am's thirst for excellence and knowledge is well reflected in her participation in various international academic programs. Ma'am is a member of two renowned professional <laughs> worldwide fund and Bombay Natural History Society. Ma'am, it's indeed an honor to have a scholar like you amongst us and to hear you speak is really a blessing. So without much ado, I would now like to request you to share your thoughts with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shirley, for the nice introduction. Um, and I wish to thank uh, Principal Professor Thomas and uh, Father Justice Paul and uh, Dr. Latanaya for setting the tone for today's uh, program. I'm indeed very happy and privileged uh, for having got this opportunity to share my uh, thoughts on this special occasion. So thank you, Ms. Shirley, for introducing me. Thank you very much. So um, I think I'll start sharing uh, my presentation. Are you able to uh, hear me and see the screen? Yes, ma'am. It's clear. Yeah, okay. So, uh, unity, whenever we talk about this uh, special day, when we remember Sardar Alabai Patel, uh, for me, uh, it would be always related to a history lesson, uh, which uh, I learned in my school. So, Many of us think about unity with relevance to uh, nationalism, national unity, national integration. And it is also a thought that uh, we always feel that it is something related to uh, people who study history. But as a, a teacher of biology, I have always been thinking that human or man has been learning a lot from nature. See, uh, many times we say uh, human behavior, most of it, we are being, we are taught how to behave or how to talk, how to walk, how to sing, how to dance and uh, how to live in unity. But in nature, we find that animals do not have that or organisms do not need any teacher. They do it on their own. And so I thought it would be apt uh, when we are going to be celebrating this day, remembering uh, Sir Vallabhai Patel, living in unity, how can we have some lessons from nature? See, these are all practical things I'm going to tell you which you can correlate with our lives also. Because as a biology person, I relate more with nature. Uh, we always take examples from nature. So when uh, Professor Thomas asked me, can you give a talk? Then immediately I thought, I'm going to talk from nature. Because very rarely we get the time to look out and see the wonders of nature and learn from nature. So that is the reason why I chose this topic today. So even the first slide that I have here, the pictures, they are all beautiful pictures of animals living together, organisms living together. When they can live together, why not we? That is my question for today. And what are the things that we need to do? Or what are the things that we can learn from nature 
so that we too can be successful like them because no one takes care of them but they still survive right so that is what we are going to see today in the following presentation so what does it mean to live in unity the dictionary meaning is oneness of mind feeling as among a number of persons so is it possible i don't know because we may we may all be living together but is there a possibility to have oneness of mind and feeling because only when we lack such things we don't have unity and other other meanings that are given are concord harmony or agreement so i would like to elaborate on these things so when you say harmony we always uh, look at a forest and say look how beautiful it is and you say that this is a place where there is harmony because you find in a forest there are not only one type of plant but different varieties of trees flowers bushes whatever you enter into a forest you see everything that you want to see in nature and each of these organisms they live in unity together complementing one another it's not that one uh, overtakes the other they all live together and so that is why we say a forest is a place where there is harmony and and another word that relates to unity is agreement with one another this is a simple visual i am sure many of you would have had an opportunity to see this if you have uh, looked up in the sky in the early evenings birds returning back to their nesting grounds after their foraging on the day or if you are a bird watcher or you are interested in birds you would have watched migratory birds up in the sky and many times we wonder why they have this kind of formation they beautifully they fly covering the whole sky line after line you will be able to see these up and this uh, formation is also called echelon and this is a kind of an agreement as we can put it in layman's term of these birds the one that is flying in the front is the leader for that uh, for a particular time period so it's not that that same bird will be leading the group always so that that bird when it flies with the flapping of its wings it gives a lift of the air next to it so those two birds give a lift to the birds behind so likewise there is a kind of a flow of wind that helps the birds to fly so the first bird is the one that needs a lot of energy and the birds that are flying later they need very or spend less energy to fly so after a few miles they change positions no one tells them when you need to change position even uh, in some of our activities we always have a count of things or we have a number of hours of working when we uh, change positions and to like that but for these birds there is no need for anyone to tell them and uh, they keep flying for miles together because they know one bird will help them through the flight one or the other so it may be a big flock but they all go together in agreement no one fights they don't say i will go next or you have to do it next or why didn't you do next nothing like that but they live in unity and uh, so to all this to happen you know most of the animals except a very few that are solitary all animals are in groups they will be in aggregations flocks or we call them as true societies okay so uh, these are the ones that from whom we can learn how to live in a society because they live together so that 
you find that individuals that are part of them are being better off than they would be on their own. So only if they live together, they will be able to survive. So for one of the example I have given here are the water fleas. Water fleas are said to be one of the minute organisms that you find in any water body. So these water fleas, they do not survive in alkaline water, but they are always found in fresh water. So what we all know, fresh water is alkaline, and but the respiratory products of a large group of them are sometimes helpful to make the water a little bit acidic and bring down the alkalinity so that these organisms can survive. So this is a simple example of how unknowingly they help each other to survive. So if the alkalinity increases in the water due to pollution, then they will all die. But their and the material that they excrete helps them to survive. And another example of grouping is flocks of birds and schools of fish. You would have seen in this these examples in maybe some documentaries or films on nature, where these exemplify groups that are much more than simple aggregations because they are not only aggregating together, but there is a high degree of social interaction between individuals and in that uh, they rely on each other for uh, different things. So uh, for protection, for taking care of the young ones and where, while they are migrating to take the proper route. So for all these things, they stay together. And we find that in the majority of studies, birds and mammals spend less time in vigilance and more time in feeding when they are in bigger groups. So what does this mean? They know that others will take care. So they can be safe in a group. So these, this is another thing that we need to learn. And one good example, this is a very um, uh, interesting example in a prairie. So these are called as meat cats. Meat cats, they live in, they are a very uh, uh, social in nature. They work together in groups and they uh, work together to kill prey and keep watch for predators and they even babysit. So that's what is mentioned in uh, National Geographic magazine because you find them to be very uh, interesting group of animals. And you can see them, the one that is sitting on the rock is actually uh, called a sentry. So this, uh, when all the other meat cats are feeding, there will be one or two which will be watching for any predator like a bird or a, even a fox that comes that way. So the rest of the group can be feed peacefully when one is on guard. So the same pattern which we also follow. So most of the time we depend on someone to take care. And in this is another very interesting uh, characteristic of these birds called starlings. You, you might have observed it even in your localities. Uh, if you have the habit of going out into uh, fields early in the morning, there is a possibility you can see the murmuration in starlings. That, that, that is the term that is given to this uh, flocking of these birds. So they normally fly in loose flocks, as you can see in the first picture, but there is a falcon that is coming to attack these birds because uh, they, uh, they can kill these birds on flight. But once they see a falcon, they all get together. These starlings, they will get together and they form a close group and uh, they will fly as close together as possible so that the falcon will not be able to target one bird. Thereby, they will protect themselves from the predator. So this is a very interesting um, uh, happening that you can observe among starlings. So many of these birds do that. And you can also find the same thing happening in schools of fishes also. They all get together and try to get away from predators. And similarly, birds hunting together, they 
do it so that they can confuse the fish. Uh, when when all these uh, the, this is a picture of uh, gannets that are coming straight from the air, hitting the water, entering in, picking up the fish. And it, it says that the fishes get confused because so many uh, birds are coming in at the same time. So these birds don't hunt alone, but in groups. And because of that, they can catch the prey easily. Similarly, hyenas, lions, they all hunt together They're, so that there is a uh, possibility of getting food. So they work together. No, no, though after they get the food, there may be a little bit of fighting to get the best part, but still, I mean, the process of uh, getting something done, they all work together. Right. So coming to uh, the next you find that there is association in groups of social animals. So it's farm for animals to associate. So what they do is they spend time closer to one another than the mean inter-individual distance, meaning like they will try to get to know one another so that Sorry, I think uh, I went out of the screening room. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, but uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. My presentation, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So the stable unit is made up of a number of subgroups of related individuals. So it's almost like how we are, like uh, we make groups of related, related in the sense it could be of various nature, but similar groups are made in animals also. So they have learned that through association, they can get recognition between individual animals they have stabilized social positions and they have a memory of social encounters that establish social status and memory of observations of the behavior of social group members. So I found it to be very interesting because all these things we as human also have. So the same uh, association we observe in animals also, but in case of humans, there is always a possibility that somebody thinks different and this social association or social relationship goes into bits and pieces. But in animals, they maintain it in an order. And uh, another thing that happens among these organisms or animals are social facilitation. So when there is adequate association, there is an ability to communicate and react. And uh, so what happens is they mimic activities, like they know how to, the younger ones learn from the parents as to how to do or what to do. And there is a similarity of motivational state and is uh, suppression of intraspecies aggression. So is that, uh, can you relate this with us, with us human beings? Like when we do similar things. So that is when we say, uh, like parents, the children would be, or like the leaders, the followers would be. So the same thing is observed even among animals. So uh, uh, like when they mimic activities, there should be a similarity of motivational state and thereby suppressing intraspecies aggression. And of course, you find social dominance among animals also. So studies have been done even in as early as 1935, there was a person called Shedarab Ebb who said that there is a definite peck order developed amongst a group of hens. And because of this peck order, 
one individual will emerge as a dominant one and that hen would displace all others. But in linear hierarchy, no bird is seen to peck an individual above it in rank. Okay, so once this social dominance is established, they settle and there is no infighting of who will take over or uh, who is the leader. So they follow the leader. And social order brings peace. So this results in maximal group bonding, minimal aggression, creating social stability. So this is what we need or we need at this hour. We need a social order where there is a bonding between individuals because that is what is lacking in us today. And a social hierarchy is not an inviolable structure. It is a state of settled out relationship between individuals. So it's not that I am uh, bigger than you or I am more powerful than you. No, it is all settled out in this relationship where you bond with one another in such a way that there is no fighting or uh, there is a social order that is stabilized that brings peace to that particular community. Right. So I'm going to show you a few examples of animals and some of the lessons that we can learn from them. So this picture shows you a group of white broad sparrow weavers uh, that they have recorded in a place in Ghana and uh, they have observed that there are 40 groups in this particular area as you can see the circles there and uh, it seems they all live in smaller groups but in the same area they share all the resources and each group is having 10 to 14 members and their descendants and they all forage together. So from one single nest, these birds will go out to feed and then forage, bring food back to the nest. So many times it seems there would be predators hovering around trying to catch these birds when they come out to forage. So during that time, they cannot go out to bring the food to the young ones. And as the, some of you may know, the young fledglings need to be fed very frequently. So there would be one or two hours of delay in feeding because of the presence of the predator. And because of that, these birds, it seems as soon as the predator leaves from that locality, they all get together and do a kind of a cooperative feeding. Cooperative feeding in the sense they get food for everyone. So it's not that it is my uh, fledgling or it's yours, but they feed all the uh, kids or all the fledglings in the nest that is uh, in under each of these areas. So I'll just uh, try to um, put in a video that shows you how big this nest is. <laughs> Right. So that's about the weavers and how they uh, live together. So as you saw, look at the size of the nest that they live in. It's almost like that of a house that we build. And it seems even in one colony, there could be hundreds of birds living together, but they live in harmony with one another. And another concept that I found 
interesting that we could learn from here is we should have the ability to collaborate and when we need to live in unity. So I have take, okay, taken one simple example of a fungi. So all of us would have seen as soon as uh, there is a rain, you find a lot of fungi growing around in your gardens and in any place that is moist. And uh, the next day you find them dead. But again, after a few days, you get a rain and you find that there is again another uh, resurgence or uh, you find many number of uh, fungi again sprouting out. And as if there are people of biology, you would know how it happens. But I, I found it to be very interesting where this uh, fungi has what we call as mycelium that grows under the soil. And it's a network that is formed and this is connected to a number of mycelia. Mycelia is almost everywhere underground. So they are connected to uh, trees, they are connected to wood that is available nearby. And uh, so it's under the soil and when they get nutrient, it is distributed to almost, uh, it is carried by the mycelia to all the connected uh, spores and because of which as soon as it gets enough rain you see a number of fungi all over the place and that is because they are all connected underground so even if you pick it out you don't want to have these uh, fun fungi in your garden so you are removing it mushrooms uh, especially you, uh, you, you can you are all familiar with these mushrooms so you remove it again it comes back so what is actually happening is they connect and they collaborate and with the synergized effort they keep uh, surviving everywhere okay so this is a very simple example and similarly uh, this is a very interesting group of uh, organisms or insects uh, you would have uh, studied in your maybe when you all studied in your school about social insects we would have learnt about um, termites and ants and honeybees so the same concept of connecting collaborating and synergizing to So as you can see, there are a number of castes as they are represented as. There are workers, there are reproductives also. And each of them perform their function properly. They do it in such a way that they are able to build such a huge termite mound and maintain this colony. So everybody does as their own work there is no one to tell them what to do they are designed to do a particular job and they do it so that this colony is maintained so you find the workers always keep the place clean or defend the mound so that nobody comes and takes over the mound and the reproductives are the ones that help in reproducing and creating new ones for the colony. And when the colony becomes bigger, in, uh, because we find that approximately each uh, termite, the queen lays thousands of eggs per day. So within a month or even within a year, there will be millions of eggs laid by a termite. And those of which may not be able to be in the they have to find a new place. So they build another mound nearby. That is why you find so many uh, termite mounds in one locality. And if you go down beneath the earth, you find there is networking. So they are all connected, but still they live in harmony. 
and another good example is honeybees so we would have observed these uh, hives around our places and we normally see all the we always say that honeybees are very active or they are very busy yes of course because they have a lot of work to do just imagine uh, starting a hive from scratch right so from scratch this sized uh, comb has been built by these small bees so imagine the hard work they have put in it's not by one be but by thousands of them and all being controlled or led by one queen bee and the queen the worker and who becomes the drone or the male and when the female or the uh, queen becomes old and that will happen after many years 13 to 14 years they say there is a possibility that one queen can hold on to one particular bee colony then a new queen emerges and then she doesn't stay here and fight with the older queen but she takes a group of workers along with her in a swarm and moves on to another place to build their own home Okay, so it is a kind of uh, peaceful living. Uh, though I have everything, I am not going to fight for my rights here. But I am going to a different place where I can start my own and live peacefully. So that is another uh, interesting fact that we can uh, see in the lives of honeybees. Right, and finally, as uh, even. in the earlier talk uh, lata ma'am was telling about acceptance so this you can very well see in a heronary heronary is a place where a number of herons live together build their nests and the young ones hatch out and they stay there for a particular period of time and then they move to uh, different places and then again the next year there is always a possibility they will come again to the same place to nest so this picture actually was taken in a uh, bird sanctuary which is near the place where i live it's a very small bird sanctuary but we find in this small uh, uh, area the within this photograph itself if you are uh, familiar with these birds you will find that there are at least four species of birds present in this particular picture so what does this mean all of them are water birds all of them depend on the various resources that are found around the water body but how come they live in harmony or live in unity and they have accepted each other and that's the reason they can live here so if you look at these kind of birds in you go to any uh, bird sanctuary you will see a number of birds nesting very closely it's unimaginable how they can be together like that and you will find that each one would have occupied a particular place and if you look at their feeding behavior each of them have different feeding preferences and because of which there is no uh, aggression shown between each bird and similarly you don't find birds of the same species also fighting with one another they maintain their nests very uh, properly and then they get together uh, without any uh, agitation they are all together most of the time and the place is so quiet and calm except for the calls of these birds so is the acceptance like this possible in humans so no tree no flower no bush is jealous of the stature of another living organism and it does not envy other trees or flowers for the fruit they bear so they just keep doing what they are doing and the tree simply accepts that it is created to be a tree and the flower accepts its purpose and accepts every season of change 
as humans on this day we too should accept who we are created to be by the creator who gave us a purpose and if we do that then i am sure that the bonds which hold unity in place like peace and love will prevail and that is possible through social order connecting with each other collaborating wherever possible and synergizing all our energy for the betterment and finally accepting each other as they are and that will lead to an india where there is unity among diversity so this is what i wanted to one of you for giving me this opportunity that's it idhar table is yeah thank you okay. for this wonderful talk i believe that the expertise that you have shared with us फॉर With great joy and immense exultation, I, Shiva Atlakha, student of BA first year, welcome you all to the concluding session of today's webinar on national unity. I feel privileged mm -hmm. listening to our experts who have shared with us their knowledge and views on this great occasion celebrating the National Unity Day, commemorating the birth anniversary of Iron Man of India, Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel. He was one of the most eminent and prominent leaders of Indian freedom struggle and being a strong and dynamic freedom fighter of India he made an immense contribution in bringing independence as well as uniting India under one flag as you all see today now to no like us further i feel humbled and honored to introduce our next great speaker dr christopher adam who is CEO and head of Dubai campus of SP Jain School of Global Management, Dubai, which is one of the world's top ten ranked Australian business schools. So, has completed his masters in business administration, human resource management, and law. Sir also has a PhD in design thinking and innovation. He is also a fellow of Charter Institute of Marketing, UK. A certified design thinker from IDEO Stanford, Sir has 34 years of experience in management consultation, marketing, and management education in India, Canada, Singapore, and the UAE. Professor Abraham has also been a visiting professor at universities in Australia, USA, Canada, Singapore, and the UK. Earlier in Dubai, Sir has led the executive MBA program of XLRI Jamshedpur. His areas of competence are strategy, behavioral design, new business models, design thinking and innovation, neuroscience of decision making, positive organizational behavior, and science of happiness. So, he is also a TEDx and global keynote speaker, and has made presentations in many forums, and has also conducted con consulting and executive development assignments for global organizations, including. the world bank governments of dubai nigeria emirates airlines dhl seva and as on to name some of you dr abhan sir has also won the education leadership award twice in the world leadership congress held in 2015 and 2017 so is also the recipient of world best ceo award in the in the uae business forum both in year 20 2018 and 2019 so is also an honorary fellow in leadership excellence at harvard square so 
has also featured regularly on leading media, including Gulf News, Khamis Times, Times of India, CNBC, Dubai Eye, Dubai 92 FM, and etc. So, is also the Global Advisory Board Member of the World CMO Council and World Sustainability Forum. He is also a strategy and innovation advisor at RTA, Government of Dubai. So, it's a great honor to have with you with us today. And we are eagerly waiting to listen to you, sir. Now, without taking much of your time, I now request Dr. Christopher Adam, sir, to take over. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. And I'm just sharing the screen. So just see whether my screen is visible. Yes, sir. It is full screen now. Okay. Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, probably, if it's a different time there. All the way from Dubai, my special greetings on this Unity Day. <clears throat> Thank you for this great opportunity to be with you this morning and share with you some interesting thoughts. I mean, very, very profound uh, uh, thoughts that came from the first two professors. I was enlightened personally to know so much about diverse perspectives of unity, and I'd like to bring in some historical perspectives to what I'd like to offer this morning. It was Mark Twain who said, India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, and the great grandmother of tradition are most valuable and most constructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India only. Now it's ironic that it has to be Mark Twain, a Westerner who has to talk so eloquently about the grandiose and the grandeur of India. Over a period of time, we've had such a colorful history. The word India connotes a billion colors a billion traditions, a billion behaviors, and a billion personalities, a billion ambitions, and a billion expectations. It's a country of contrast. It's a country of ambitions. It's a country of history, 5,000 years of uninterrupted civilization and history. And to put it in perspective, you know, we are today talking about unity because of all the disparity that we see around us. But if you go back to the history of our nation, we are a nation that has never ever invaded another neighboring country. We have always, on the other hand, welcomed people from across the world. Right from the time of Nalanda and Taxila, when we had the oldest universities in the world, we had people coming from one side from Greece and the other side from China. And when the great voyagers, the adventurers like Vasco da Gama and others came across, they were searching for the valuables, the treasures, and the spices of India. We need to be proud today to remember that we belong to a legacy, a generation which is to be proud of its heritage, a heritage that is not just vocalized by Westerners, but from people across the world. Today, we are the fourth largest economy in the world. In spite of the pandemic, we will rise back, we'll come back with full power, with full uh, you know, gusto once this situation changes. We're a country of many ethnic groups uh, across from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. We are a nation of diversity, a nation with so many varieties, so many colors and so many interesting things, a land of myriad languages. We have more than 150, 22 official and the rest which are spoken by tribes and people across India. We are a study in contrast, a study of unity in diversity. In fact, you could say we had a veritable babel of tongues from across and from a land of diversity with different modes of apparel which reflect our lifestyles, our choices, our behaviors, our personalities, and our histories and traditions. For the most part, the continental dimensions of the country account for these variations and diversities. We are not just a nation, we are a continent, a continent with such colorful contrasts and in spite of these contrasts, a wonderful unity of traditions, of history, of languages, of culture. And that I think is the unique nature of India. We are, a, we are a nation that has embraced every religion on the planet. When they came across, we were a country, a nation that accepted. 
And when the first professor, Dr. Lata, spoke about, she spoke about the power of the Indian Nakshatra in terms of the Constitution. The various elements that talk about secularism, acceptance, inclusiveness, and diversity. And I think that's the remarkable character of the Indian nation. There are certain common links that unite us as people. And in order for us to desire that goal of unity amidst diversity, of course, we need to do a number of steps. And I'll try to conclude when I come back to my conclusion from the biological and sociological and anthropological origins of how this is possible and how we need to go back to our roots. I want to share a few inspiring stories which will probably set the context in place. This is a funeral pyre, as you know, but this is a very special funeral pyre. This is in a village called Sendwa, Madhya Pradesh, and the pyre is in memory, or rather, the last remains of an old gentleman, a Hindu gentleman called Sitaram. And Sitaram actually did not have any family members, any relatives. But the village, which was predominantly Muslim, ensured that he had a respectable burial according to Hindu traditions. I think this is the unique fabric of India, that we innately have this brotherhood and sisterhood among our fellow citizens. But somewhere down the line, narrow parochial fundamentalist views have come across to corrupt our minds towards these fundamental beliefs and systems of love and compassion and unity and brotherhood. In fact, Vasudeva Kudumbaha, which uh, Dr. Lata spoke about, is another character of the Indian ethos. The second one is another unique example of unity and diversity right here in India. This is a mosque in Malapuram, Kerala, and every year there's a celebration of a Hindu person called Kunelu, and this happens at the Valiangadi Juma Masjid, and every year there's a festivity, a celebration, a remembrance of a Hindu person called Kunelu in a Muslim mosque right here in South India, Malapuram. Probably these beautiful stories don't come out and see the light of day, and probably that's one of the reasons, and probably the toxic media that feeds us narrow parochial sentiments to divide us in a paradox of contrasts. But the reality is we still have these traditions. We still have this rich heritage that is happening across. And would you believe me, you know, if I had to ask you as a quiz question, this is inside a jail where you have inmates from uh, the Muslim religion, you have inmates from Hinduism, you have inmates from other religions, and they all, you know, follow the fasting and they're breaking the fast together during the month of Ramadan. How many of us get to see these beautiful stories being enacted across different aspects, different towns, different cities and different villages all across India? What we hear is a toxic series of, uh, you know, controversial comments made by the media. You know, it's true that superficial observers are likely to be bewildered by the astonishing variety of Indian life. You know, I have a few friends who come from different parts of the world and they are overwhelmed by the variety and the diversity that India has to offer. And India can't be, you know, consumed or understood in one uh, visit or one aspect. They fail to discover that India is unique in a dimension of what we call one in many and one truth with many different songs. And that has been the song that we've been playing all these years, all these hundreds of years, the inclusiveness and the acceptance and the diversity. And that I think is a key hallmark. So the understanding is that the individual in the aggregate and the simple in the composite, that is the unique fabric of India. With them, the whole is lost in its parts. But for us, what is needed is the superior interpretation, the synthesis of the power of mind, and I'll come back to that in my conclusion, that can give rise to a vision of the whole, that we as one big nation, a nation of rich traditions and heritage, divided by cultures, but united in one accord. Albert Einstein, again, a Westerner who said, we owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made. And I think we have forgotten these great legacies and heritage that India gave to the world. Probably 
you know, in another ironic way, you could say it's 400 years of colonial hangover that we have become slavish and, uh, you know, subsumed by uh, the aspect of being subservient to another higher power. But if you do a keen penetrating insight, you will not fail to recognize the fundamental unity beneath the manifold variety in India. We are together across these different traditions, religions, rituals, castes and subcastes, but we are together. The diver diversity itself, far from being a damaging cause of disunity and weakness, is a fertile source of strength and wealth. And that is the uniqueness of India. This has been pointed out by historians. It's been pointed out by leaders. There have been many attempts to break India, but I think the spirit of being India or Indian is something unique that can't be taken away from us. Sir Herbert Riceley has rightly observed beneath the manifold diversity of the physical and social types, languages, customs and religions which strike the observer in India, there can still be discerned an underlying uniformity of life from the Himalayas to the Cape Comoran. That's one end of the nation to the other end. And this again is an observation from a Westerner. Probably we being so close to each other don't realize this unique nature of our nation. From his long term and first hand experience in India, another Westerner, Vincent A. Smith says that the civilization of India has many features different from that of other regions of the world. While they are common to one country in degree, is sufficient in treatment as a unity in the history of human, social and intellectual development. And we are not talking about 100, 200 years. We are talking about a 5,000 year old civilization that stood the test of time. Even the early historical history unmistakably shows that the political consciousness of the people has from the very, very early times. We did have different religions. We did, did, did have different regions. We did have different cultures, different kingdoms. But even then, we had a united nation called Hindustan. It was Chanakya many thousands of years back who grasped the whole of India as a unit and assimilated the entire area as a theater of its activities. George Bernard Shah said the Indian way of life provide the vision of the natural and the real way of life. We veil ourselves with unnatural masks on the face of India are the tender expressions which carry the mark of the creator's hand. What a profound statement by one of the greatest literary giants of the last century. India is not a mere geographical expression, nor is it a mere collection of separate peoples, traditions and conventions. India is much more than this. The best proof lies in the fact that Indian history has quickened into life. In terms of our religion, our races, our castes, our subcastes, nationalities and communities, but the heart of India is one and it beats for unity. And we are all heirs to a common and rich culture, a culture of diversity, a culture of acceptance and a culture of inclusiveness. Our heritage consists of our art and literature, as they flourished many centuries ago. And it serves as a bond of unity between people of different faiths and creeds. And that is the India that you and I portray when we look at the colorful Indian flag that represents this unity in diversity. The streams of different cultures have flowed into our subcontinent to make us what we are and what we will be. Romain Roland, the French philosopher, said if there's one place on the face of this earth where all the dreams of living men have found a home from the very earliest days when men began the dream of existence, it is India. And it can't get more profound and more exciting than the statement. There were Dravidians in India even before the coming of the Aryans and Hinduism is a blend of cultures of the north and the south. And we see this in the temples, we see this in the traditions, we see this in the festivals. India has 150 dialects and 22 recognized regional languages. Each one is unique and each one portrays a characteristic of India, which has a rich, 
cultural heritage of the grand treasures in music, in fine arts, in dance, in drama, in theater, and sculpture. And the list can go on and on. Our sages and seers have left behind a tradition of wealth of knowledge and a wealth of uh, a tradition of piety, of penance and spiritual greatness. Across religions, of course, a conquest of passion and our scriptures are the storehouses of spiritual wisdom, notwithstanding a single religion. Every single religion has some remarkable things. Our saints aspire to the realization of the infinite, which is today on the domains of quantum physics and quantum mathematics. We have inherited great spiritual values, contrasted with which the materialistic progress of the West appears insignificant. Charity and love. Love, which is the greatest power on the planet, which can unite communities across the world. And charity, which are critical factors of the power of giving, the universal brotherhood that we spoke about, Vasudeva Kudumbaka, the fear of God, piety and unselfishness, control of passions and peace of mind. These are part and parcel of the fabric of India. Our cultural unity is further exemplified, exemplified by the temples of the South and of Kajuraho and the caves of the Ajanta and Elora, which are shining examples of India's proficiency in sculpture and architecture. Our music has come to enjoy worldwide popularity. Indian classical music like the Indian dances is built on the concept of ragas and talas. Each raga is regarded appropriate to a certain time of the day and time. And you may not know this, there are believed to be about 250 ragas in common use in North as well as in the South. In the modern times, People like Ravi Shankar have taken Indian music to the West and thus bridged the gap between the music of the East and the West. Other significant features of our unique Indian cultural unity are the variety, color and emotional richness of our dances. The country abounds in tribal dances, old dances, as well as classical dances of great virtuosity. So much of diversity, so much of differences, but within that is a unique unity incomparable to anything else in the world. Throughout India, need is regarded not merely as an accompaniment to social intercourse, but also as a mode of aesthetic expression and spiritual realization. The classical theater of India has a history of more than 2000 years. It was performed in palaces and in temples. And the classical plays combine music and dance and the range of themes covered is wide. It's up to the younger generation if those of you are listening, college students, it's up to you to withhold and uphold this torch of cultural unity for the rest of the world to see, follow and emulate. Because in a world which is now being obsessed with technology and mobility, we need to understand that we have so much of richness in our culture, in our heritage, in our traditions and in our civilization and not get dazed by the superficial prosperity and material achievement of the West where man has set foot on the moon in his quest for space travel, but finds himself isolated in his own society and community. Grant Duff, the British historian said, many of the advances in the sciences that we consider today to be made in Europe were in fact made in India centuries ago. And this is the rich tradition, the rich history that we need to give to ourselves. Let me end this with some final thoughts in terms of diversity and collaboration. There's today intense research in the social sciences across the world to actually prove that diversity and collaboration bring about breakthrough innovations and breakthrough results and performance. So if we could tap into this diversity, the richness of our culture, the richness of our diversity, and ensure that we collaborate as one nation, you can't get better than that. And I'll finish with a beautiful, inspiring story right from India, which actually proves this. So what about community? We as one big community, you may have heard of this concept called the fittest survive, which was perpetuated by Charles Darwin. But you may not know that we not only survived as a community, humanity at large, but we actually thrived. And thriving is prospering. Thriving is getting better and better. Thriving is 
getting remarkable prosperity by doing something remarkable. And so what was that that we did? Dr. Priyadarshini spoke about that when she presented herself. It was about collaboration, cooperation based on compassion and empathy. We call it, the, and there's plenty of research anthropological evidence on this. So today it's not only sociology, it's not only anthropology, it's biology that tells us that we as a community can come together. We learned our lessons from the bees. We learned our lessons from the birds. We learned our lessons from the ants, which Dr. Priya Darshani so beautifully articulated in her presentation. Let us also realize as a species, we are not here to fight. If you don't believe me, neuroscience today has an answer. The power of empathy, which is the ultimate before compassion and love, is embedded into every human being. And that is mirror neurons. These mirror neurons are a gift from Almighty God, biologically embedded in each human being to transfer empathy between each of us. So why are these differences? Why are these conflicts? Why are these wars? Why are we fighting? We are fighting for two reasons. One, because of politics, and two, because of narrow parochial value and belief systems. If we could break that and believe that we as one large community, one large humanity, one large Indian body that can create remarkable uh, you know, things together, you can't get better than that. And small children don't look at religion. Small children don't look at uh, gender. Small children don't look at culture and tradition. They look at oneness of humanity. I think maybe it's time for us to go back to our roots. And the scientific case for unity and diversity has been validated by research studies. A few months back, there was a, a book written by a Dutch professor called Rutger Bregman, which was about humankind. And professor argues in that 400 pages tome that the entire history of humanity is a history of love, compassion, kindness. We might be, might, might sound very contradictory but it's counterintuitive that we as humanity, as a species, have been created to love each other, to empathize, to show compassion. And that's what we are. And if you don't believe me, Mera Bharat Mahan, I have a beautiful story to share with you. Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who said we are Indians firstly and lastly. You know, this is the encapsulation of who we are. And you find all the religions right there. And in the middle is what we call an Indian, a proud Indian who embraces all religions, who embraces all cultures. And here is the story that I've been promising you. Many of us know that India is a space power. We also know that India's ISRO is one of the most respected, venerated organizations in the world. But I don't know how many of you know the beautiful history of ISRO. It started way back in the year 1963 in a small island, a fishing hamlet called the Thumba. You can see the picture on the top. When Dr. Homi Baba, a Parsi scientist, and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, a Jain scientist, who wanted to build India's first space research center, they were looking all over the country and stumbled upon this fishing hamlet called the Thumba. Why did they look at Thumba? Because Thumba was very close to the equatorial latitude. And they wanted to go there and build it. Everything was getting approved. And then they stumbled upon something. And in between, let me also introduce the third person who was there as part of the team. The Parsi Dr. Homi Baba, the Jain Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, and the Muslim Dr. A.P. Abdul Kalam. They foraged and then they found this little island called Thumba. But for one simple stumbling block, there was a huge St. Mary's Church, which was built by the Jesuits, built on very strong, Christian Catholic traditions. And they were flummoxed as to how are we going to do that because it's going to affect the religious sentiments. So they approached the court and the court said it would be better if you could speak to the religious people. And then they met with the bishop, Reverend Peter Bernard Pereira. And Reverend Bernard Pereira was, uh, you know, given this state of affairs as to what the plan was about setting up India's first space research organization. So the next week's Sunday service, Reverend Peter Bernard Pereira, the bishop, actually spoke to the congregation and asked them that this is the first step towards India's foray into science and space technology. And as a community, I think it is our onus to do that. 
But he said, if you don't accept, I'm not going to do it. And when he finished his sermon, the entire congregation said, Amen. And then it was joined. The team was joined by Dr. Satish Thaban, who was a Hindu. Friends, I think the message is loud and clear. Today, India is right there on the cosmic planetary system, sending up the world's most cost efficient rocket systems. And we also created a unique record of sorts by sending the largest number of satellites in one single shot. And all because five different amazing human beings who represented five different religions came together and created this miracle called the Indian Space Research Organization. It today is a test of pride for what India can achieve. It also is unity in diversity. And that I think is a powerful story that each one of us can remember. This morning, when we remember Unity Day as a special you know, day for us to remember, to come together as brothers and sisters, let's not forget that way back in 1963, these five individuals representing five different faiths came together to create the magic called India. And I want to end with the simple, beautiful video. Long live unity, we are one. And we owe this to our next generation. We are here, we have seen it, we have seen the enmities, we have seen the frailties, we have seen the parochial differences. But I think we owe it to our next generation and how better to celebrate that than from the mouth of a four year old all the way from Northeast India. Uh, sir, Can you sir, the sir, video is visible, but the audio is not coming. Audio is not coming. Yes, sir. Maybe. Sir, try increasing the volume. Now it's sir, sir, stop, stop sharing first of all. Pardon me. First of all, stop sharing. 
Okay. You want me to play it again? Let's uh, start uh, sharing one more time. Stop sharing now. Okay. Uh, when you start sharing, uh, at the top of that desktop screen one, you will see include system audio. Yes, hold on a minute. Okay. Just a minute. Include system audio. Just check it. Okay, wait. Uh, okay, where is that? Sir, start sharing when that uh, window pop up now. So Wait. just above, above that desktop. Open the share tray, okay. Yeah. Above that screen one, desktop. One minute, one minute. Okay, screen one, okay. No, sir. Above that, there is the option. Just include system on. audio. Just, just hold on. Yeah. Are you sure you want to share? Okay. Um, Ah, include system audio. Okay. Yes. Now shall I play it again? Yes, yes. I'll play it from the beginning then. Is it okay now? Yes, it's now coming. Okay. Yeah. 
this beautiful song written by you know, Bankim Chandra many years back, music played by a Muslim, A.R. Rahman, and sung by a Northeast Frontier Christian girl, Esther Namte. She's four years old, but I think you owe it to these youngsters, the children of our future generations, that we as one nation come together and prove to the world that we can still remain great and we can still remain in unity and still remain the formidable power that we were created to be. Jai Hind. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I hope it was useful for all of you who are listening. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Father Thomas, I mean uh, Dr. Thomas at the SFS College and especially Professor Philip for the technical support and all the rest of you for your patience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your motivating and inspiring talk. It was indeed a great moment to listen from you, sir, on how diverse but united we are. As you rightly said, we are not just a continent of languages, we are not just a nation. We are a continent of languages and culture. And indeed, Vasudeva Kutumbakam is our belief that is the basis of unique fabric of our nation. And the beautiful video at the end really made us fall deeper in love towards our great nation. We all are proud to be Indians, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, our participants have posted a few questions which, which I would like to forward to you, sir. With your permission, may I, sir? Please. Okay, sir. The first question is, sir, as you rightly said, that the beautiful stories of our unity in the nation is not broadcasted and toxic stories are fed through us through the media. Then, what should be the way forward so that such toxicity does not affect the unity of our nation? I think a concerted effort, a great question by the way, a concerted effort has to be taken. So you might want to know, where did I get these stories? Which means they are somewhere there out in the media. There is an amazing website called Better India. Yes, the Better, Better India. India.com is an amazing website that actually encapsulates the true spirit of who we are. The little known stories that happen across the length and breadth of India. People helping each other, collaborating, cooperating, contributing, making their particular communities better. Those stories don't come out on mainstream media. So it might be a good idea for us in an educational institution. I have encouraged all my students right here in Dubai. I encourage people wherever I go, you know, in different parts of the world to actually subscribe to these websites. And every day you get updates of those inspiring stories of ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And I think the mainstream media, there's a, there's a whole bias. If you look at the media, the regular media, there's a whole bias, uh, which is very parochial. They infect, in fact, big sites. If you watch any particular item, uh, you would have a couple of sites which talk about one particular dimension and you have another two stations which will talk exactly the opposite. So I think we need more regulation in terms of an appreciation of the good things that happen rather than divisive forces that try to pull us apart. Because there's so much of strength and unity and today it's validated by biology, by anthropology. I think it's time for us to come together, intellectuals, academics, students, professors, I think we all need to come together. We need more of these stories to tell us. How many of us know the story of ISRO? ISRO, as I told you, the Tumba story. Yes, it's the story of India in integration. Exactly. It's exactly sir. that. If you go into it, it really, you know, makes your hair raise because that is the true story. That's the power of unity. And that is what we are. And that doesn't come out in mainstream media. And the media has a tremendous influence on our negative yeah. beliefs, and our negative value system. I'm sorry to say this. I'm extremely critical of the media because of the, the detrimental influence it has on our thought processes. Exactly, sir. Yeah. So I think we need to capture these stories and we need to get more of these stories across to the world. So we need to have new mechanisms like the betterindia.com to share these lovely, inspiring stories and get them across, you know, in various uh, medias. Yes, sir. Like sharing the news from the Better India that I also subscribe to and also sharing with our classes. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Good to hear that. Thank you so much. Any sir. other questions? Yes, sir. This is the last question. Wonderful. How can colleges promote the centuries old tradition of India that is Sambad? In this, we have free intellectual debates on various topics of India, 
Their people agree to disagree. Nowadays, this is not seen in a nation. Such debates are not really held. Nowadays, everyone is disagreeing with each other. So, what is the way forward to bring back this tradition, sir, in all our colleges? Yeah, again, see, this is something which we need to understand that our roots are embedded in empathy. So, I'll give you an example from Dubai. Now, in Dubai, Indians constitute the largest population. We are almost about 20 to 25 percent. And we come from all over India. So you have Gujaratis, you have Rajasthanis, you have Tamilians, you have Malayalis, you have Kashmiris, you have everybody. You have a little India there. We have all kinds of cuisines. We have all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, festivals. And we don't see any differences. It's one India. And we all belong to various uh, associations, the Indian Association, the Indian Cultural Association, where we celebrate everything. The Dandia is celebrated, the Pongal is celebrated, the Christmas is celebrated, the Ramadan is celebrated. I think that is what I, I think probably we need to learn a lesson from Indians abroad because there we stick together as one big unity. We don't okay. fight, we don't fight there. There are no uh, differences. We have absolutely no issues. And I think this happens in other countries also. When we are in our own country, I don't know, I think we take unity for granted. <laughs> yes. say, seriously. So I think yes, that we need to have that. And we also need to understand that today biology validates that love and compassion are embedded that sociology and anthropology validate. I've given you scientific evidence. So this has to come up that we yes, are sir. one big community and we have had that in our traditions. We don't even speak about the Vasudeva Kudumbagana, which is a very ancient tradition. Exactly, sir. You know, this tradition of heritage and hospitality is uh, embedded into our culture, into our ethos. And we need to bring that back. We are one. Exactly, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much sir, for answering our questions. Now, that was uh, indeed a motivating and extremely informative session. Now, I understood that it is love that can unite all of us and universal brotherhood is the way forward for a great nation to continue to be united. So, we are honored and privileged to have you and all our previous speakers with us today. Now, with a heart filled with gratitude, I, on behalf of the management and principal, Dr. Keithi Thomas, sir, take this opportunity to thank our eminent speakers, Father Justice Paul, Dr. Lata Nair, madam, Dr. Priya Thashini Rajendra, madam, and Dr. Christopher Abraham, sir, for having made this day a memorable one. Thank you so much for being here and for enlightening and inspiring us, and most importantly, for giving us your valuable time. Once again, I extend my sincere thank you. Now, I also take this opportunity to thank our organizing team for their constant support and efforts in making this program a grand success. I wish to thank our principal, Dr. Katie Thomas, sir, for giving us this opportunity to listen to experts and learn a lot from them about the importance of national unity. Now, in the end, I wish to thank all the participants for watching our today's live session on the occasion of National Unity Day. I now conclude the program with great quote of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Manpower without unity is not a strength unless it is harmonized and united properly, then only it becomes a spiritual power. Before I conclude, I request all our participants to fill the feedback form and we will submit the same. Now, sir, we are proud to be the children of this great nation. Now, I request all of you to rise for the national anthem. Thank you and Vande Matram. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Uttkada, Banga, Vindya, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga, Uttchal, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Mage, Gahe, Tava, Jaya, Gatha, Janagana Mangala Dayaka Jaya He Bhanaka Bhagya Vibhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He